certainly big fears that we recognize and try to deal with. And, but I think there's a lot of little things that we probably have let into our lives over a long period of time that we just may not even really realize are there. But one of the fears that we have that we may not even think is fear is doubt. And you know, doubt really is a very close relative to fear, or we might even say that it is a type of fear. And I don't even think that it's so much that we doubt God, but I think a lot of times we're just, it's self-doubt. We might, we might believe that God can certainly do something, but we're not sure he'll do it for us. Or we believe God does speak to people, but we don't believe that we ever hear him. Or we think if we get somebody else to pray for us that God will hear them, but we're not quite sure that he hears us. And so tonight I want to talk to you in many different ways about doubt. And I really hope by the time you leave here tonight that you feel a whole lot better about yourself than maybe you did when you walked in. And I pray that you'll learn some things that are going to help you have a much better relationship with God, perhaps, than what you do. You know, God admires boldness, I believe. I really believe that God admires bold, holy, courageous confidence. And when I say boldness, I'm not talking about a, you know, I can do anything attitude. I'm talking about I can do all things through Christ attitude. Something that I say all the time, Lord, I'm an everything nothing. I'm everything in you and nothing in myself. I can do nothing without you, but I can do everything through you. So holy confidence is a confidence that's in God. It's not a self-confidence, but it's a confidence that you're able and capable that you can step out in faith and be bold and do whatever you need to do. The only way that you can have that kind of confidence is if you're not afraid of maybe being wrong or making a mistake. So often, we're so afraid of making a mistake that we just won't even step out and do anything. I'm sure that of the 12 disciples that were in the boat when Jesus came walking on the water, and at first they were frightened, they saw this person, they didn't know it was Jesus, walking on the water. They thought maybe it was a ghost. And then they realized that it was Jesus. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you on the water. Well, I bet that the other 11 would have liked to have stepped out too, but somehow or another, Peter was the only one that had the boldness to try. And he walked for a while, and then he sank because he got afraid. But the good news is, is Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. And I have found out that even if I walk for a little while, and then I fall down for a little while, and then I get up and walk for a little while, that in those times of falling down, God will always reach out his hand and pick me up and help me get back on my way once again. And I would rather try and fall down a little bit and try again and fall down a little bit and finally learn how to walk than to just stay safe in the boat and never try to do anything. There's a great big wonderful world and many opportunities waiting for every single one of you. Now listen to me now. Don't live a boring, boring, boring life. Did you hear me? Well, I'm just so bored. Well, you know what? If you're bored, I'm quite sure it's your own fault. And a lot of it comes from just getting so addicted to safety that we just keep doing the same old, dumb, boring, safe thing over and over, and we won't ever step out and do anything different. I realize, and this, you're going to laugh when I say this, but I realized when I was about, oh, maybe approaching 50, and this was back when women still wore a lot of pantyhose and nylons, that all my life I had worn suntan pantyhose. <laughs> and the other ladies were wearing navy blue ones and black ones and pink ones and Ones with designs on them, not me, I always wore suntan. 
And it was a big step of faith just for me to step out and wear a different color of <laughs> nylon. And I'm not even really that much of a cowardly person. But we all have certain things that we would kind of like to do. We see other people doing them and we kind of like to do that or try that. But, but we're just afraid. And I want to encourage you tonight to start living a little more boldly and to pray a lot more boldly. And to step out and follow your heart and do what you really believe that God is giving you an opportunity to do. I'm not suggesting that you do foolish things or that you, you do something that you're just trying and you don't really have any indication from God that it's the right thing for you. But I just believe that God wants you all to have a much bigger life than what you have. I believe that he's got a great, big, large, wonderful life for us. You know, Peter did lots of really stupid things. I mean, big time stupid sins. But I believe that one of the reasons why God kept working with Peter, of course, was that he loved him. But secondly, Peter did have a boldness. I believe that God admires boldness. You know, Zacchaeus was a little short guy that wasn't able to see Jesus because there was such a huge crowd. But he was bold. He ran on ahead of the crowd and he climbed up in a tree so he could see Jesus. And interestingly enough, when Jesus passed by, his attention was drawn to Zacchaeus and he said, come on down here. I'm going to go to your house for dinner. Why out of all those people did he go to his house for dinner? Well, he was the only one who climbed a tree. And you know, you can translate that climbing the tree into just about anything that you want to. I'm sure a lot of people walked off that day and said, oh, too many people, I can't see them. They wouldn't make the extra effort or go the extra mile. Caleb, the Bible says, the Bible talks a lot about Joshua and Caleb, and it says that they had a different spirit, a different spirit than the rest of the men. And when the land was being divided out to the tribes, Caleb said, give me that mountain. 85 years old, and he said, give me a mountain. Are you ready to take on a mountain at the age of 85, or have you already decided you're too old to start something new? Now, I know you're not all in the category of older, but you will get there sooner or later. And you don't want to have a wrong mindset about it. You don't, you're never too young and you're never too old to do something great for God. It's never too late to begin again. I said it's never too late to begin again. To live boldly, we must walk in faith. But doubt is always sent to war against our faith. Remembering that doubt is a type of fear. Fear is sent to war against our faith, but many times that fear comes in the form of doubt. Did I make the right decision? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Well, I kind of feel like I should, but I don't know. And we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Does anybody here ever get tired of indecision? You know, sooner or later, you just got to make a decision and try something. And hopefully it'll be right. But you know what? If it's not and you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. At least you learn not to do that again. I've learned a lot of things by doing them wrong first and then finding out later how to do them right. Let's look at Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. A very familiar story about Abraham. I think I just shared it in another context in my last conference, but it fits so well here I have to share it again. For Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, he hoped on in faith that he would become the father of many nations as it had been promised to him. God had said, your descendants shall be numberless. Well, the problem with him having descendants was he didn't even have any children. He did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about a hundred years old. 
or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's deadened womb. He did consider it. He did think about it. He did look at it, but he still believed that God was greater. But now watch verse 20. No unbelief or distrust or doubt made him waver, doubtingly question concerning the promise of God. Now it doesn't say that doubt and unbelief didn't present itself to him. It says that it didn't make him waver. In other words, I think Abraham had enough faith in God that when doubt came, he doubted his doubts. So maybe the next time you're stepping out to do something and doubt comes, you need to say, I doubt that doubt. I believe God and I doubt my doubts. You have to remember that doubt is just trying to confuse you and steal from you. And it wars against your mind. And one of the things that we need to learn how to do when we're in confusion is we need to just stop and turn the brain off and look in our heart. Just stop and say, what is really in my heart? What do I really believe? Not what do I think. How many of you know there's a big difference in what you think and what you believe a lot of times? The battlefield is the mind, and Satan will do warfare with your mind, firing one thought after another, after another, after another. We talked this morning about the fiery darts of the enemy. And how the shield of faith is the only thing with which we can quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. And I think those fiery darts are thrown at our minds and at our emotions. Amen? And so when you believe in your heart that you're supposed to do something, and it usually comes like, it's like an unction or what I call a holy oomph. It's like, oh. And then you start to think about it. It's amazing how many dreams we kill by thinking about them. I always say you can think a thing to death if you think about it long enough. <laughs> David had confidence that he could kill Goliath. Even though he was much smaller, wasn't well equipped, Saul said, well, you'll at least need to wear my armor. He tried to do that. He couldn't do it because David wanted to just go in the confidence of God. And I love what the Bible says that when him and Goliath were talking back and forth and Goliath was threatening him, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that to you. Of course, David was talking back, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, and this day I'm going to cut your head off. And the Bible says that David ran quickly toward the battle line. And I love that, because I think if he would have stood there and looked at Goliath too long, he might have ran in the other direction. And I think that Abraham considered his impotent body, but he didn't stare at it for three weeks. He maybe looked at Sarah, who was a little bit old and wrinkled and had already had to change of life, and thought, eh, no way. <laughs> so the Bible says this doubt and unbelief, and we have to understand when we read these stories that these were real people. I honestly believe that a lot of times we read about these people in the Bible and we don't get it that they were real people just like us. The devil was after him, them, they had thoughts, they had to walk in faith, they had doubt, they had fear. And the things that we see them do are put here for us to learn from that if we will follow their example, we can have the same kind of victory that they had. And so what does it go on and say about Abraham? If we can put the scriptures back up, it says that no unbelief or distrust made him waver or doubtingly question concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong and he was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. So what did he do when doubt came? He opened up his mouth. And what is praise? Praise is telling a tale about the goodness of God. He gave praise to God. It probably went something like this. God, I remember the good things that you've done for me in the past, and I remember how faithful you've been to me since you told me to leave my home and go to a place that you would show me, and I've seen you do this, and I've seen you do that, and I give you praise, God, that you're going to do it again. Doubt cannot make you cave in if you will open your mouth and war against it with words of faith.
And you know what? It's easy to doubt. It's easy to go with the way you feel. But I'm telling you the truth. If you will open your mouth and say the right things when you're in a battle. Now listen to me. When you're having a battle in your mind, the best way to stop wrong thoughts is to open your mouth and say something right. When the devil says you're not going to make it, you open your mouth and say, I'm going to succeed in God because everything I lay my hand to prospers and succeeds. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Talks about that in Ephesians 6 also. And it says we are to wield that two-edged sword. Well, when does doubt come? Doubt and unbelief comes when we're waiting. You know, if we prayed and got what we wanted immediately, we'd never have a problem with doubt and unbelief. So why does God make us wait? Because our faith must be tested to find out if it's real and genuine. And it must be tested in order for it to grow. Stretching causes growth. And many of you, I might even be able to say most of you, <laughs> are in a place in your life right now of being stretched. And it's amazing how irritating it can be sometimes when you know that you know that you know that what you're asking God to do would just take no effort on His part at all. <laughs> and yet, He just makes you wait. Is anybody there right now knows what I'm talking about? Or you keep having to deal with the same thing over and over and over and over. Let me tell you something. I don't know what kind of week you had, but I didn't have such a hot week either. We had one thing that I was dealing with that I'd been dealing with for a long time, and it was a very stressful day of dealing with it. And lo and behold, after dealing with it for almost four years, got a breakthrough and a good report. But now, wait, 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 wait. The same day, something else came up that I thought was solved. I was sure that one was solved. I was just enjoying my peace, thanking God for victory, and the whole mess started up all over again. We always all have something to practice on. I was kind of glad that I was preaching on faith this weekend. Because even if you don't need it, it'll help me. We all have times of getting what we want, and we all have times of not getting what we want and having to wait and stretch our faith just a little bit further. And the only thing that I've ever found that will help me is to just believe that God knows more than I do and that all things will work out for my good in the end. So whatever you're... Whatever it is you're waiting for, and no matter how hard it is, when you're in those times of being so tired of waiting and you just want to say with your mouth, I just can't do this anymore. Instead of saying that, you need to open your mouth in faith and say, God, you'll never allow more to come on me than what I can bear. If I couldn't take this, you wouldn't be letting it happen. And I know that you will not be late, not one single day. At just the exact right time, my breakthrough is going to come. Doubt comes during times of waiting. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, that we only inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. Not just faith, but faith and patience. Patience. The Greek word for patience says it's a fruit of the Spirit that only grows under trial. So we release our faith and then we get a trial. <laughs> we release our faith and then we get opposition. We release our faith and then we have to wait a lot longer than we want to wait. And during that time, we are developing patience. So we never receive the fulfillment of our faith unless we also have some patience to go along with it. And patience is not just the ability to wait, it's how we act while we're waiting. 
I can tell you one of the ways you can shorten your weight. <laughs> I'll pray for you what Paul prayed for the church in Colossians. He never prayed for their problems to go away. Never one time do you ever find Paul praying for any of the churches for their problems to go away. Do you know that he never prayed that one time? But I'll pray for you tonight what he prayed for the Colossians. I pray for you that you would be able to endure whatever comes with good temper. And see, from the get-go of a problem, if we can keep praising God and just remain stable, keep walking in love, don't get a bad attitude, I think the wait would probably be a lot shorter than what it is. You know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out why we have to have these times of growing. All we have to do is watch how we behave during trials. I'm going to talk to these people over here. They're behaving better than you guys are. Isn't it amazing how much faith we have until we get a problem? Hey, it's easy to sing, I surrender all. Exodus 13, 17, I want us to look at something that I find interesting. When Pharaoh let the people go, God led them not by way of the land of the Philistines, also that was, although that was nearer. <laughs> For God said, lest the people change their purpose when they see war and return to Egypt. In other words, what he's saying there is God purposely led them the long, hard way. Why? Because he said they're not really ready for war. Well, why did they need to be ready for war? Because God wanted them to go in and possess the land. But if you study the word possess, it means that in order to possess, you have to dispossess the current occupants. So when God sent them into the promised land, he wasn't sending them into a place that had no enemies. It was full of enemies. There was going to be war after war after war after war. <laughs> They had to take Jericho. They had to take one city after another after another. And God had to let them wander around out there, having their bad attitude, murmuring, complaining, grumbling, finding fault, being impatient, wanting to run back to Egypt. Because when they first came out, they were not strong enough to go in and possess that land and deal with the enemies in there. And many of you have very big dreams in your heart and things that you want to do, and you don't understand why God's not letting it happen. Well, maybe you're not ready to deal yet with the enemies that you would have to face if your dream opened up. Let me tell you something. If you're praying to be used by God, the more people you can help, the more opposition you're going to get. 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul said, A wide door of opportunity opened unto me, and with it many adversaries. <laughs> I wish sometimes that I could explain to people, and I, unless I wrote a very long book, I couldn't, about what it's taken and what's been required for me to get from February of 1976 when I felt like God spoke to me about what he wanted me to do with my life to now. I don't even have any idea how I would even begin to tell you the pain, the stretching, the millions of times I wanted to quit and give up, the opposition from people, the opposition from the devil, the times my body's been attacked, my mind's been attacked, my emotions have been attacked. I don't even know how to begin to tell you, but you know what? I wouldn't trade it for anything in the whole world. Nothing. The word doubt means to be without a way, and we're never without a way because Jesus is the way. To be without resources, to be embarrassed, to be in doubt, to be perplexed, to be at a loss, to stand in two ways, being uncertain about which way to take. We need to learn how to 
trust God, let him lead us and guide us, and then confidently go forward and do what we believe that he's asking us to do. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, teach us some very good things about doubt. Let's take a look at that. James 1, 5 through 8. If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God, who gives to everyone, not just the perfect people that have been good, he gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly. Now watch this because it's important. Without reproach or fault finding. And if you looked at James chapter 1 beginning in verse 1, he's talking about times of trial and times of spiritual growth. So can I go so far as to tell you that even if we have gotten ourselves in trouble, open a door through our own lack of knowledge, our lack of wisdom, and we ask God to help us, even if my problem is my own fault and I ask God to help me, He will forgive my sin, He will not find fault with me, He will not reproach me, and He will help me and He will help you. Now that's good news. Isn't it good news to know that you don't have to be good all the time to get God's help? Now let's put that back up. And it will be given him. Next verse. Only it must be in faith that he asks with no wavering, no hesitating, no doubting. So I'm going to stop right here for a minute. And I just want to encourage you to believe that no matter how bad you've been, God wants to help you. And the moment you ask him to forgive you, it's a done deal. And not only that, if you're sincere in your repentance, you do not have to feel one moment's guilt. Oh, Joyce, it can't be that good. Oh, yeah, it is. God's pretty good. Ah, yeah, God's pretty good. I think he's probably a whole lot better than what we realize. Oh, yeah. Think about that. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something that I realized about three weeks ago that is just almost more than I can take. Do you know that God created us for relationship? And in order to have relationship with anybody, you have to really, even though you don't realize it, you have to kind of pre-decide that whatever they ever do during your relationship that bugs you, offends you, irritates you, or hurts you, that you'll forgive them. Otherwise, if you don't, relationship stops. And I was thinking about this like with my relationship with Dave. You know, we've been married 45 years and we've had to forgive each other, the Lord only knows, thousands of times. It used to be really hard, now it's pretty easy. It's just like, I don't, I'm not wasting my energy fighting anymore. You're forgiven, go on about your business. I don't have no more energy left for that kind of stuff. But really, if I intend to stay married to Dave, and I do, then I have already really decided that whatever he else he does, I will forgive it. How many of you understand where I'm at? You're with me, okay? I mean, how many of you have children? Now, is there anyone in this room who expects that child that you have to never hurt you or disappoint you again? No, we know better than that. But you know what? You really have already decided that you're pretty committed to the kid. It's so easy to forgive people that you love. And I just thought, you know what? The Bible says that God knows the end from the beginning. And that every word in our mouth that we have not even uttered yet, God already knows it. So whatever it is we're going to do wrong in life, and there's going to be plenty of it, God already knows it. And in order to stay in relationship with us, He has already decided to forgive us. All we have to do is ask Him and receive. Now that is just absolutely so amazing, I can't hardly take it. Ask and receive that your joy might be full. Not ask.
ask and doubt and ask and doubt and ask and doubt and ask and doubt. <laughs> Just ask and receive. The forgiveness for everything that we would ever do wrong was already provided over 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. All the forgiveness that anybody in the world would ever need forever was already bought and paid for. And all we have to do is admit our sin, confess our sin, be willing to turn from it. And the Bible says that he forgives our sin and removes the guilt. It took me a long time, but I have caught the sneaky devil. And I know now when I've repented and he still tries to make me feel guilty that it is false guilt and I am not taking it. It's a lie. It's false. Because if my sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west and God remembers it no more, he put it so far from him he doesn't even remember it, how can we be guilty about something that doesn't even exist? Wow, 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 wow. My goodness. Mm -mm -mm. Too good to be true. The Message Bible of James 1, where we've been reading, says, Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Don't think you're going to get anything from the Master that way, adrift at sea, trying to keep all your options open. God wants us to pray boldly. Not these, now oh God, if you'll just... And God, if you'll just forgive me this one more time, then I promise I won't do it again. Yes, you will. <laughs> you most certainly will. And you might as well just go ahead and tell him, God, I have no idea how many times you got to forgive me for this. <laughs> now, it's one thing if you're getting up every day with a sloppy ad attitude, trying to sin, and you don't even care. I'm talking to people tonight who love God with all your heart, and you want to do the right thing, but you just make mistakes. I tell you what, God is a God of hearts. He sees our heart. How could God say that David was a man after his own heart? When David committed murder and adultery and he lied and he caused all kinds of problems and I'm sure he hurt God. And yet the Bible says, long time after David's sin, David is a man after my own heart. Why? Because David really did love God. He just got a serious case of stupid on him for a while. <laughs> Have you ever, even in the midst of loving God, gotten a serious case of stupid for a while? Amen. I want to tell you something. The Bible says a thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, now get this. I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And we cannot enjoy our lives with doubt and fear and worry and every kind of torment and being offended and feeling guilty. We can only enjoy our lives if we learn how to believe the word and live boldly and say these promises are for me. They're not just for everybody else. They're for me. For me. Ephesians 3.20 says God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we could ever dare To hope, ask, or think, according to his power that worketh in us. Let's look at Ephesians 3.12. In whom, because of our faith in him, now don't miss this, we dare 
to have the boldness, the courage, and the confidence of free access and unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear. Let's read it again. In whom, because of our faith in Him, how can we do this by faith? Not by our own perfection and record of good works. But when you know what a rascal you are, how can we possibly come to God any way other than in faith? Because of our faith in Him, we dare, we dare, we dare. <laughs> we take that chance that if we step into the Red Sea, it'll part. We take that chance that God's Word is true and we're going to act like we believe it. We dare to approach Him with boldness and confidence, with an unreserved approach, with freedom and without fear. We don't even have to approach God wondering if He's mad at us. Are you always judging yourself? Are you your own judge, jury, lawyer? And is the verdict always guilty? Guilty? Do you judge every move you make? I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I should have done better. I shouldn't have bought that. I shouldn't have gone there. I shouldn't have eaten that. I didn't pray long enough. I didn't read the right chapter in the Bible. Didn't confess the word today. Didn't hug my kids. Spent too much at the grocery store. I talked too much. I should be quieter. I should be a better mom, a better dad. I should be a better grandmother. Should be a better wife. Bingo, you're right. That's the whole point. I'm reading a book by a guy and he said, uh, after he preached one night, a man came up to him and said, your message just really offended me tonight. And he said, I think you are full of pride. And the guy said, bingo, you're right. He said, but I'm so much better than I was a couple of years ago. You should have known me then. And see, the good news of the gospel is... I do make all those mistakes all the time, but it doesn't matter. Not because I'm getting up every day trying to have weaknesses. But we all have them. We just all have them. And if we didn't have any, then there would have been no need for Jesus to go through what he went through. Did you hear me? And if you want to live under the law, you're welcome to do it, but I highly don't recommend it. There's two ways to live, according to Galatians. Two covenants, the Bible says in Galatians 4, and they're both represented by two children that were born to Abraham and Sarah. One was born according to works of the flesh and represented slavery and bondage. One was born remarkably according to promise and his name meant laughter. If you want to enjoy life, you got to let God be God. And that means believe the word. Get up every day and do the best you can. And know that God understands and sees your heart. And if you love him, just love God and let him love you. Make it more about relationship than your own perfection. Don't find something new 20 times a day to be mad at yourself about. Let's get more like the Apostle John. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. I mean, isn't that amazing? 
It's in the book of John that John wrote, and he's talking about himself. And three times he says, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. And David said, I am God's anointed. Well, most of us would no more think that we could say something like that. Well, who do you think you are? I'm God's anointed. Wow. <laughs> Stop trying to impress yourself with your perfection. Come on now, somebody needs to write that down. I started to say stop trying to impress everybody, but I think really we're trying to impress ourselves. Stop trying to impress yourself with your perfection and just say, God, I'm such a big mess, I don't know how you could ever possibly do anything for me, but I tell you what, you said you would, so I'm going for it. I'm gonna go for it. I know I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay and I'm on my way. Amen. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Well, yes, we all need to change. There's no doubt about that. But you can't change yourself. And if you don't believe me, just keep trying. Just give it another good three, four, five, six years, or maybe even ten. And when you're totally and completely worn out with your own effort, then you can go read Galatians 3, 1 through 3 again and see if you're ready to believe it. Let's take a look at it. Galatians 3, 1 through 3. Oh, you poor, silly, thoughtless, unreflecting, and senseless Kentuckians. Now, I know everybody watching on TV is not from Kentucky, so this includes your state, too. Who has fascinated or bewitched or cast a spell over you, unto whom right before your very eyes, Jesus the Messiah was openly and graphically set forth and portrayed as crucified? Let me ask you a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as a result of obeying the law and doing its works, or was it by hearing the message of the gospel and believing it? Watch. Now, was it from observing a law of rituals? Was it from your own perfection? Or was it simply from a message of faith? How did you receive Christ? You came to the end of yourself. You said, I'm the biggest mess that I could possibly ever be. My life is so messed up and I can't do anything to fix it. God, I cast myself on you. Please forgive me and take me just the way I am. And it was the happiest day of your life. Now let's look at verse 3. Are you so foolish and so senseless and so silly? <laughs> Having begun your new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit, are you now going to reach perfection by depending on the works of your flesh? You can't change yourself. You say, well then what do I do, Joyce, if I know that I have an area in my life that needs change? I'll tell you what you do. You agree with God because you wouldn't even know that it was wrong with you if the Holy Spirit wasn't convicting you. And when you get convicted, the first thing you should not do is get condemned. Conviction is intended to lift you out of the problem, not pound you down into it. Amen? And not only that, when we're convicted, we should be enthusiastic about it, according to Revelation 3.19. For whom the Lord loves, he chastises. So be enthusiastic and full of zeal when God tells you your faults, is exactly what it says. Why does he tell you? Not to make you feel bad, but to help you overcome. So the first thing you do, you receive that conviction graciously, yes, God, you're right. Bingo. <laughs> I am what you say I am, full of pride, a mess, whatever he tells you, lazy, hard to get along with. Complain all the time, give up too easy, whatever it is. I agree, God, that's exactly what I am, and I'm so sorry, would you please forgive me? 
And God, I trust you to work in me and change me. Then the thing that you do, this is something that the Bible tells us to do. It doesn't tell us to try to change ourselves. Did you ever see a fruit tree making fruit through going... No fruit. Let me try again. <laughs> no, what does John 15 says? If you abide in me and my word abides in you, <laughs> you will bear much fruit. So what do you do? Whatever area it is that God brought conviction in, you go to the Bible and you study in that area. I don't believe we use the word of God correctly many times. Yes, it's great if you want to read the Bible through in a year or something like that. But let me tell you something. If you've got a bad temper, you don't need to study prosperity. <laughs> Come on. You need to study everything you can find on anger. Use the word like medicine. If you've got a headache, you don't stick a Band-Aid on your head. You know what to do? You take some aspirin or Advil or Tylenol or maybe you're so spiritual you don't have to do that and you just pray. I don't know, but we know what to do. You cut yourself, you put some kind of rub on it. You don't go sticking aspirin in the cut. But the Word of God is like medicine. It will heal our soul. It will renew our mind. But let me say what I said again. If I've got a bad temper, I don't need to study prosperity or success or blessing. I need to study anger. I need to study patience. And when I take that word into myself and I begin to meditate on it and I study it over and over, you know what I'll find out? Without all the... I'll just start getting nicer. And when I get mad, it won't take me nearly as long to calm down. And then I'll study some more, and then I'll find out I'm not even getting mad like I used to. And then by the time I've studied about 30, 40 years, you can't even hardly make me mad anymore. <laughs> so we're on a journey. God changes us from glory to glory. Not as we struggle. Not as we feel guilty, not as we hate ourselves and we're mad at ourselves all the time and we put a wedge between us and God in our relationship. But as we dare to go boldly before the throne and say, God, I know I've got all kinds of issues. Just for the sake of short, we'll call them issues. <laughs> but I'm so grateful. Now, listen, this is going to be hard. But I'm so grateful that you're pleased with me. Now you say, whoa, wait just a minute. I can handle the forgiveness. I can underhandle the mercy thing. But pleased with me? Eh, eh, eh. God can't be pleased with me. Yes, he is. You say, no, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Yes, he is. There were two times... Matthew 3 and Matthew 13, where a voice came out from heaven saying about Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. My delight is in him. Now I want to ask you, what would have happened if Jesus would have said, Oh, no. <laughs> no. You say, well, of course he was pleased with Jesus. Jesus was sinless and never did anything wrong. Yeah? Well, you know what the Bible says? It takes to please God. Let's go to John 6, 28. I can hardly wait. John 6, 28 and 29. Ooh, hurry, 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 guys. This is so good. Then they said, what are we to do that we may habitually be working the works of God? What are we to do to carry out what God requires? In other words, what must we do to please God? This is the work that God requires of you. That you believe in the one whom he has sent. So, Jesus never did anything wrong. We do stuff wrong all the time, but if we have our faith in Him, then God sees us as in Him. 
And so whatever Jesus gets, we are joint heirs with him and co-inheritors. So when God spoke over him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, he also said it to anyone who's in Christ. Oh my gosh, I may have to run the building. I don't know. In Christ, we are born again. In Christ, we're sanctified. In Christ, we're redeemed. In Him, we can pray in His name and get our prayers answered. Come on, you need to shake off some of this nonsense.
em đến không tam kỳ quê tôi từng đông lúa xeo vui nhìn nắng mai hoa xưa ông vàng tam thanh biến gọi đẹp tựa lòng dân thủy chung chắc phai một thời chiến tranh đất mẹ hồ 